Hey, Cypher here. This is a video much like my World War II and Cold War lectures, where I had time to record a lecture in the proper style so that I could upload it here. And put a little bit of background music and cut out all the breaths and all that kind of stuff. So this is from my US History course, and it's on the Second Great Awakening. Beginning in the 1790s and going all the way through the 1840s, there were a series of religious revivals. Just like the First Great Awakening, this Second Great Awakening had major political and cultural consequences, but this time it was more rooted in oncoming nationalism. People were starting to argue what it meant to be American. Much of this started in reaction to perceived moral slippage from the Founders' generation. A new generation of Americans came to see the previous generation as having fallen afoul of religion. Because they saw that the founding generation were trying to modernize too much. That modernity was a bad thing. A lot of the founders were deists, which means a belief in God without divine intervention. For instance, Thomas Paine, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson were all deists. In fact, in 1804, Thomas Jefferson created his own Bible by cutting out all of the miracles from the New Testament and removing the Old Testament altogether. He hadn't actually completed his version until 1820, but it was well known. And in fact, in 1904, Congress started giving out copies of the Jefferson Bible to any new congressman, and that continued all the way into the 1950s. So that was basically the story of Christ without any miracles, because Jefferson didn't believe in such a thing as miracles. And that's kind of what a deist is, is the belief that there is a god, but he doesn't intervene. Also, a lot of the Founding Fathers were Freemasons. At least nine of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were actually members, including the most prominent signature of them all, John Hancock. Other early major Freemasons included the likes of Paul Revere and Chief Justice John Marshall. Even the first president, George Washington, was a Freemason which all of this led to the creation of the Anti-Masonic Party in 1828 over conspiratorial fears that these people were trying to take over America and basically hurt people, even though it was pure conspiracism. But ignorance is pretty deeply rooted in American history. But with these two things, we can already see how people would interpret a slippage from Christianity. Many of the Founders didn't believe that Christ had worked miracles, nor were they particularly open about their secret societies. This gave rise to deep suspicion about two new trends, the rise of industrialization and Unitarianism. As the U.S. began to industrialize a little bit before the War of 1812, and then at a rapid pace afterward, more and more Americans began working for wages, which meant the end of guilds and apprenticeships, which were seen as kind of a stabilizing force for society. It didn't help that industrialization used a lot of new machinery that seemed scary for people who were not aware of the beastly contraptions. Stoking these fears was a new and prominent form of Christianity called Unitarianism. Unitarians disbelieved the idea of a holy trinity, as in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost are all one thing. They instead believed that there is only one God, and he is not split in three. This fell well in line with Jefferson's beliefs, though he wasn't actually a Unitarian, he was a deist, which are different things. But even so, during his administration, he said, I confidently expect that the present generation will see Unitarianism become the general religion of the United States. Not to be outdone by Jefferson, John Adams and his son John Quincy Adams were both Unitarians outright and members of congregations specifically as Unitarians. Back in England, Unitarians were seen as no better than Catholics because they denied the Holy Trinity, but that was old world thinking according to the Founders, not so much to religious zealots. And what really scared them was that in 1805, a guy named Henry Ware became the president of Harvard. Specifically, Harvard at this point was a seminary school. They taught preachers and whatnot. 
and even though Harvard was officially non-denominational, this made Harvard effectively a Unitarian institution. And even then as now, it was the most prominent institution in the U.S. for higher education. This initiated what was called the Unitarian Controversy, which was basically a countrywide discussion about what Unitarianism as a church or theology should mean. The entire theology was up in the air, it didn't have a particular meaning. You could have people who believed that Christ was God, or you could have people think that Christ was some sort of demigod, like he was just the Son, but had no divinity in and of himself, much more aligned with how Jefferson thought. In fact, Unitarianism was so disparate that it didn't have an overarching organization until 1825 with the founding of the American Unitarian Association. With the prominence of Unitarianism and the rise of industrialization, these were seen as kind of the endpoint of the Enlightenment movement. In Europe and in the United States, an answer to the Enlightenment came in the form of Romanticism. Romantics saw the Enlightenment as elitism, and that rationality was a corruption of the soul, so they were explicitly anti-modern. This fed into a new understanding of culture coming from Germany. A lot of the most famous romantics were German, such as Beethoven and Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Beethoven was a famous composer from Austria who signified the romantic movement through his many allusions to nature and subjectivity. Now realize, though he was from Austria, at this point that was considered part of Germany. There would not be a distinct German country until its formation in 1871, so much after this point. But this whole idea of Romanticism fed into a lot of what Germans were starting to call Kultur, which was their own conception of culture. And especially with Goethe, who focused on kind of folksy storytelling, he started to give Germans their own identity through those folk tales. You see, the word culture comes from the Latin for cultivation, as in being well cultured. This isn't really how we use culture today, nor is kultur how we use it today most of the time. The German conception of culture has more to do with defining what is authentically German. One thinker at the time named Herde identified it as the totality of experience that provided a coherent identity and sense of common destiny to a people. So essentially, Kultur it was about defining insiders and outsiders, who to be included or excluded. So Romanticism became explicitly about defining authenticity, how you could be authentic to yourself. But it was very much about exclusion, as in things that were inauthentic had to be removed. Hence why Romanticism is also the root of nationalism. You see, especially in Germany, there was no such thing as a Germany. There were many, many countries, and by the end of the Napoleonic Wars, they weren't even unified under a singular empire. But even before that, the Holy Roman Empire wasn't much of an empire to begin with. And of course, all of this affected Americans, who took on their own approach to finding authenticity through Romanticism. And that authenticity was specifically against modernism as in the Enlightenment thoughts of deism, Freemasonry, industrialization, and other kinds of theologies like Unitarianism that explicitly challenged what they thought was the most authentic form of Protestantism and therefore needed to be revived. So Methodism became the breaking point for a new Great Awakening. They had emerged in the first Great Awakening in the early 18th century, but until the 1780s, they only functioned as itinerant preachers commissioned from England. But in 1784, Francis Ashbury was ordained as the first Methodist bishop of the United States, meaning that he could commission other itinerant preachers. This made the Methodist Episcopal Church of the United States. Realize 1784 is only a year after the signing of the Treaty of Paris, English Methodism was still very much tied back to England. So despite the Baltimore Christmas Conference, which is what established the Methodist Episcopal Church, by about a decade later, folks like James O'Kelly thought that the Episcopal system centered too much power on people like Asbury. So O'Kelly created a more southerly Methodist church, which was focused on evangelizing the gospel, as in spreading the word of Christ, in a way that they thought was more authentic 
to the American experience, hence why they called themselves the Republican Methodist Church. So with the focus on evangelizing and a growing want to find some sort of authentic American religion, these evangelicals wanted to fight against the forces of the Enlightenment. So they began to call for a restoration of Christianity. People began to complain about over-sophisticated Calvinism. Calvinism was at the root of most Protestant theologies in the United States. And a lot of people thought that it was getting too complicated, and so they wanted a restoration to a more primitive form of Christianity, one that was closer to what Christ himself would have taught, at least to their conception of that primitive state of Christianity. So it was very much about having a purer form of Christianity. That primitive purity went hand in hand with the idea of the American frontier, which many Americans in the early Republic looked west as fertile ground for the new republic to test its foundational principles. The frontier was more authentically American, and its mythically primitive lands were perfect grounds on which to test primitive Christianity. But in the 1790s, this was mostly from pamphleteers, rather than preachers directly interacting with their congregations. It wasn't until 1809 that Thomas and Alexander Campbell launched the Disciples of Christ with a declaration and address from Pennsylvania. So there were people who were openly pushing for a restoration, and now there was an organization to evangelize deep into the American frontier which is where a series of revivals began. The first of these came in Kentucky in 1800, where everybody kind of assembled into a camp just to listen to several sermons over the course of a week. This created a format, and especially the following year at Cane Ridge, this format became solidified with the Stone Christians in Kentucky. And essentially, everybody would go and gather into a camp to go and listen to sermons. And these sermons were fiery about how the Enlightenment and modernity were destroying America. And there was a real need to bring back primitive Christianity, because that was truly American. But at first, most of these were fairly one-off things. They were a group of preachers who just decided to have a camp, but there wasn't really an organization until the Disciples of Christ in 1809. In 1816, the American Bible Society formed specifically to disseminate the Bible and encourage its study which eventually ended up having Bibles in every hotel room in America. It's because of the American Bible Society that that's the case. And their whole purpose was to spread the Bible. So in 1818, for instance, they started translating the Bible into American Indian languages so that they could spread Christianity to the various tribes. And they tried to keep themselves away from politics. For instance, in 1834, they explicitly refused to join the American Anti-Slavery Society, even though that's society was trying to donate to them. They had to refuse the donation. So by the 1820s, the Second Great Awakening was in full swing, trying to revive Christianity and remove the influence of the Enlightenment upon American society. But these camp meetings and everything were mostly in the frontier, as in the West. But the Great Awakening happened elsewhere as well. And just like with the First Great Awakening, there was a reaction to it. Even though Great Awakenings are always in reaction, there is always a reaction to the reaction. And so Congregationalists in the Northeast wanted to spread their own evangelism. In 1801 through 52, there was the Plan of Union, which had numerous congregations supporting missions to evangelize the West. These congregations included Unitarians and Presbyterians. But because congregations are essentially decentralized and loosely affiliated churches, they had to come together under this plan of union to evangelize westward. And by the 1820s, because of a series of Massachusetts Supreme Court rulings, congregations stopped being allowed to exclude particular members simply because they had Unitarian beliefs, which eventually meant that Unitarians outnumbered Trinitarians in the Northeast. And since Unitarians were much more liberal than Trinitarians, this pushed the conservative members further and further west. As the Northeast became more and more centered around Unitarians, they had their own split in 1836, when a Unitarian named Ralph Waldo Emerson published a sermon called Nature, 
And this was essentially a split from Unitarianism because he focused more on a simplistic philosophy of becoming closer to nature, hence the name of the sermon. The idea is that as one becomes closer to nature, one is closer to God. It was about the removal of ostentation, because one could be happiest with the least. Transcendentalism was essentially the Unitarian version of primitive Christianity. They thought that regular Unitarianism was too far from God as in too far from nature. And the most famous outcropping of this was in 1854 when Henry David Thoreau published Walden, where he went and spent a couple of years out on a pond in Massachusetts trying to live the transcendental lifestyle and poetically talking about how great it was. It is one of the great works of American literature. But with these competing revivals, a lot of it began to center around the Erie Canal in New York. Soon, that became the center of the Great Awakening. By the 1820s, preachers from around the country were coming to New York specifically to make revival camps. It was such a hot spot that the area became known as the Burnt Over District because of how many revivals had happened in the area. And a few movements started there, such as the Holiness Movement, where Methodists believe in the individual's ability to gain spiritual perfection. In 1837, Phoebe Palmer really pushed for the idea that individuals can find their own holiness. And by 1841, they split off from the Methodist Church. Another movement that started in the Burnt Over District was Adventism. From 1831 to the 1840s, William Milner preached that the advent, as in the second coming, of Christ was coming at a certain time. He kept pushing it off as more and more dates came along, but he kept on making it about the 1840s. And he increased his rhetorical fire and brimstone, saying that if people didn't believe in this advent and worship God properly, then they would be dooming themselves. But of course, as with any kind of prediction, Jesus Christ did not come in 1844, leading to what's called the Great Disappointment. But Millerites decided that they would have their own splits, and in 1845, several groups met in Albany, New York, to form several other groups, which include the Advent Christians Church and Seventh-day Adventists today. While they still believe that the second coming of Christ is imminent, most are not so foolhardy as to predict an actual date like William Miller. Throughout all of this, no other group came to symbolize what the Second Great Awakening meant than another offshoot from the Burnt Over District, the Mormons or the Latter-day Saints, as they called themselves in 1838. Before that, Joseph Smith, their founder, grew up in the Burnt Over District. In 1820, he proclaimed that he had his first vision, saying that he was going to find a new gospel. And in 1823, he claimed to have found the plates on which to base that gospel on. And so he translated it to create the Book of Mormon. As he started to gain a following, in 1829 he started baptisms, and in 1830 he published the Book of Mormon, thereby forming the Church of Christ. Just a year later, they moved to Kirtland, Ohio to form a religious commune. After that move was done, they formed what is called the First Presidency. Just like so many other communes, it was basically a separate state, which meant forming its own government under Joseph Smith. They even had their own secret police, also known as Avenging Angels, which didn't officially form until 1838, but there were several enforcement mechanisms throughout the period. They had their own militia, bank, and even dietary standards, which basically regulated all of regular life. This is called theocracy, as in a state completely governed by a religion. And in fact, Mormons would often vote as a block so that they could maintain their theocracy. Supposedly in this period, Joseph Smith had a secret revelation that adultery was permissible. Probably helps that he was rumored to have relations with other women other than his wife. There wouldn't be actual scandals over it until a decade later in 1841, where newspapers started publishing accounts of Joseph Smith's polygamy. And so in 1843, he had an open revelation saying that polygamy was okay by the word of God. The church as a whole wouldn't officially sanction it until 1852, after Joseph Smith's death, 
but he certainly engaged in it, and the church would be officially polygamous all the way until 1890. So you could see why people would find this uh, discomforting. You have a Christian commune that's creating its own police, militia, and having their own unsavory relations. Plus, there's that whole issue of having an extra gospel that most Christians think is sacrilegious. And Joseph Smith envisioned a mechanism that would avoid having to stay in one place if they were unwelcome, because he sought Zion, as in the land of God, which he envisioned in the 1830s as increasingly further and further west. This was partially because they were being targeted for their beliefs. The first major example of this came in 1832 when a mob tarred and feathered Joseph Smith, and Kirtland became an increasingly unfavorable place for Smith. In 1837, the Kirtland Safety Society formed as a religious bank. Through this bank, several other members of the Church of Christ managed to take control, and then they excommunicated their founder, Joseph Smith, which essentially made everyone who followed him leave for Missouri. Before that, there had already been several members trying to go to Missouri because Smith had a revelation saying that Zion was near independence. In 1838, he established a new headquarters in Far West, Missouri. That's the name of the town, Far West. As part of this move, this is when he officially started taxing the members through tithing, as in all members had to pay a certain percentage of their wealth to the church. And this was enforced by Danites, as in those avenging angels I mentioned before. This led to yet another power struggle among the Mormon leadership, especially when new followers came from Kirtland. And because of all this, the Missouri state started looking at how it could regulate this, especially since, you know, the Mormons had their own militia. And Joseph Smith gave a sermon declaring the church's independence from persecution, which Missouri read as him declaring independence from the United States as a whole. And this could only lead to violence, with secret police and their own private militia versus the actual state militia. Violence was inevitable. Soon there was a minor brawl over voter registration, which led to the residents of Carroll County to vote the Mormons out, who of course refused to leave, leading to a siege in DeWitt. After such an attack, Mormons went on the offensive, driving all non-Mormons from Davies County. So while there's all this fighting already happening, the governor of Missouri, Lilburn Boggs, decides to take his side, and he issued Order Number 44, which said, the Mormons must be treated as enemies, and must be exterminated or driven from the state, if necessary, for the public peace. Their outrages are beyond all description." So even though it's unclear who started the fighting, it is very clear who did the first major attack, and that was Carroll County, not the Mormons. But as a result of this, the Missouri militia drove out the Mormons, which included the Hans Mill Massacre, which killed 15 of them. Once the militia surrounded Far West, they put it under siege, and Joseph Smith surrendered. He was actually tried by court-martial rather than a normal court and sentenced to death. But a U.S. Army general named General Donovan refused to carry out the sentence and let Joseph Smith escape. Given all of this craziness in Missouri, the Mormons were given refuge in Illinois, so they founded Nauvoo as a new Zion. And they quickly returned to their old tricks with the formation of the Nauvoo Legion in 1840. But this time, their private militia became officially part of the state militia. In 1841, a new temple was built, and by 1844, Joseph Smith declared himself king of a new kingdom. It's unclear whether or not this was meant to be metaphorical, or if he was actually declaring himself king. Either way, that's not something Americans look too kindly on. And so you can see he was already gaining a huge amount of opposition. What fueled a lot of this opposition was the practice of dead and proxy baptism, where essentially a Mormon would take on the name of some non-Mormon who was probably already dead and then baptize them by proxy. This is actually still a practice today. But people thought that that was desecrating the names of the people who were non-Mormons and being supposedly baptized well after they were gone. With all this opposition, when Smith declared the kingdom, many people opposed him. And so a newspaper formed called the Nauvoo Expositor was founded by a bunch of excommunicated Mormons and disaffected Gentiles. Gentile meaning non-Mormons. But because it was so openly critical of Smith, he had it burnt. 
Burning a printing press, especially after you had declared an independent kingdom, was one of the worst crimes that Americans could even think of at the time. And so, of course, Smith was arrested. But before he could even stand trial, a lynch mob formed and killed him in the jail. Just like in Missouri, tensions escalated as militias and vigilantes began to harass the Mormons, just as they were having a succession crisis over who would lead the now leaderless church. This led to some internal fighting. It looked like the entire Mormon church was about to disintegrate. But the person who won most of the adherents during that succession crisis was Brigham Young, who declared a year later in 1845 that they would leave for Utah. In 1845, that was still in Mexico, but it was so far north that no Mexicans had settled there. But of course, by the time that they started making it there in 1848, that would no longer be the case. When they declared the formation of Deseret only a year later, that was American territory. They started near the Great Salt Lake and spread out from there, which is why the Church of Latter-day Saints is still headquartered in Utah which has a long and winding history because of their Mormon origins. As you can see, the various movements within the Great Awakening had tremendous political power, and many tried to use that to extend their own reform movements, which they'd call a benevolent empire. And these benevolent empires pushed a lot of political movements. For instance, there was religious communism. In the 1820s, a Frenchman named Charles Fourier theorized and systematized a form of socialism, which essentially called for the association of all adherents to put all of their property into a commune, as in to own property communally, and that all goods produced were for the benefit of the larger group. This form of socialism is called associationism, and essentially people would form a commune oriented around some sort of religious principle and try to operate it under Fourier's ideology. One of the earliest of these formed in 1841 around Brook Farm, Massachusetts, where transcendentalists, trying to commune with nature and everything, formed their own commune under Fourierist's ideology. Sometimes these weren't actually explicitly religious, for instance with the North American phalanxes throughout the 1840s. In 1842, the Hopedale community formed as practical Christianity to promote temperance, abolitionism, suffrage, spiritualism, and education. So by 1842, you can see that these religious communes were already very much about pushing some sort of political ideology beyond just religion. And there were a series of other groups, for instance, the Skanites in 1843, which was the first Society of Universal Inquiry, plenty of other transcendentalist communes, even some Methodist communes, and some groups, like the Oneida community in New York, which formed in 1848, really pushed a millenarian output. Now, millenarianism means kind of like the Adventists, that they see that the second coming of Christ is imminent, that the apocalypse will happen very soon. That's called millenarianism. The Oneida community was pretty interesting because they were essentially swingers. As in, they had no compunction having sex with each other, no matter who it was. Essentially, they believed in free love. And Oneida was famous for its silverware, which was the main good that they produced. Though obviously there was plenty of other kinds of spooning going on there too. So there's all of these communes coming around. Of course, most communes ended up failing pretty quickly. But these are insular communities. These benevolent empires from Transcendentalism, Methodism, Presbyterianism, all of that kind of stuff, became incredibly entwined with political movements to make laws to enforce purity, which led to the formation in 1826 of the American Temperance Society. Now, temperance means that they essentially want to discourage the use of alcohol. And in 1826, that was quite an extreme position, since a lot of people had to drink beer specifically because the water was too tainted to drink safely. But instead of saying that people should die of thirst, they espoused what's called teetotalism as in using other methods to purify water, and therefore no need to ever drink alcohol. And even though it has the word tea in it, it doesn't actually refer to tea, but that was one of the methods that they would propose instead of drinking beer. By 1836, several other temperance movements joined together to form the American Temperance Union, 
and four years later, the Washingtonian movement formed to stop alcoholism by having alcoholics pledge not to drink. So how would movements like temperance and communism, or even Adventism, be pushed further and further west? Well, through missionaries. Almost all the churches mentioned thus far had their own missionaries. And they tried to take their missions to Indian communities or even foreign countries to spread their particular version of Christianity. The largest of these started at the Triennial Convention in 1840, which was a massive Baptist missionary effort. Because of their missionaries, Baptists quickly overtook Unitarians in terms of Congregationalism everywhere other than Massachusetts. So by the late 1840s, Baptism was the largest denomination in the United States. And this is partially because they would send out missionaries and gain converts everywhere they possibly could. Another political movement that was pushed on by all of this was feminism. Keep in mind, women were a significant part of all of this. The First Great Awakening had made women's roles in churches a prominent feature of American religion. And with the Second Great Awakening, they used their increasing prominence to remove laws like what's called coverture. From the 1820s to the 1850s, more and more states eliminated coverture, which essentially says that married women are not allowed to own property, that any of their property is automatically their husband's. This was seen as undemocratic, and in the age of growing democracy, coverture meant that women could not participate in all of these revivals in that if they were stuck without property. This culminated in 1848 with the Seneca Falls Convention. They published a Declaration of Sentiments which said, Such has been the patient sufferance of the women under this government, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to demand the equal station to which they are entitled. So, at this point, they were not only asking for the end of coverture, but for the beginning of women's suffrage. Since most states had eliminated property requirements for voting, women gaining property was not sufficient enough for them to gain the vote. And this began an 80-year effort for women's suffrage. From the 1850s onward, there were almost yearly conventions trying to push for women's suffrage, state by state, county by county. But of course, the most controversial political part of the Second Great Awakening was the rise of abolitionism in the 1830s. Especially with Unitarians, abolitionism gained a prominent foothold with people like William Lloyd Garrison. But this illustrated one of the most prominent divides during the Second Great Awakening, race. Since slavery had steadily shifted south from the late 18th and early 19th century, it was mostly a southern thing by the Second Great Awakening. And so Unitarians, who pushed abolitionism, pushed for the end of slavery, which was a prominent southern thing, despite Unitarianism being a prominent northern thing. So race really defined who was to be included in this religious revival. There had long been what were called praying Indians, as in Indian converts to Christianity. But with all these missionary efforts, this became part of the forefront of the United States' supposed civilizing efforts. From the 1820s onward, many Indian agents would be Christian missionaries. Once Indian removal was effected in the 1830s, this included many prominent missions throughout Indian territory. But of course, that wasn't the only racial divide. There were many black freemen in the United States. At that Christmas conference in 1784, there were actually two black Methodists. But due to their race, they were not allowed to vote. One of these was Harry Hosier. He was a famous black Methodist, and even founding father Benjamin Rush said of him, making allowances for his illiteracy, he was the greatest orator in America. Throughout the 1780s, he became an inspiration for slave owners to convert their slaves to Christianity. But in 1791, a false charge, which was clearly racially motivated, led to his falling out of favor. As you could see, the Methodist church was fairly racist, despite the fact that they had several prominent black members. And so a split formed in 1787 with the creation of the Free African Society. But they were just a society within the church until in 1794 they created their own Episcopal church called the Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church, which was ran by Richard Allen. But it was just a church. A full split didn't come until 1816, but this was because of increasingly racist rhetoric from white Methodists. 
Of course, with so many black Methodists, part of the missionary efforts of that church was to convert slaves. There's no way of knowing how benevolent the intention was, but many of them really did believe that they were saving slave souls. Of course, that quickly meant that slave owners learned that it was an effective pacifying technique. So, slave owners would allow evangelists to come and evangelize their slaves. Of course, if you believe in saving a slave's soul, then probably elevating them out of slavery is a prominent goal. Which meant that a lot of these missionaries became the focal point of several conspiracies and rebellions. Most prominent of which came in 1831 because of the Nat Turner Rebellion. Nat Turner being a Methodist himself. This, of course, freaked out slave owners who clamped down on black people being allowed to read and made sure that only white people were allowed to evangelize their slaves, therefore maintaining the pacifying mission of Christianity. With all this opposition to slavery coming from religious movements, many conservatives thought that was politicizing religion too much. And with the Baptists becoming the most prominent church in the 1840s, Southern Baptists became more and more concerned with the abolitionism of their northern brethren. And so in 1845, they split from the church, creating Southern Baptism, specifically to preach pro-slavery. Many other churches, like the Presbyterians, would end up following the Baptists' examples and splitting over the issue of slavery, which forebodes the greatest political divide that would split the country in twain, leading to the Civil War. So the Second Great Awakening has huge consequences beyond simple religious revivals. It came to define American nationalism. From such a simple motivation as a return to more primitive Christianity and a rejection of modernity, this romantic movement came to define what was authentically American, and framed how that debate over authenticity would be fought for decades to come.